I'm going to, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm going to give an intro uh, to glaciers and sea level, which will be fairly short, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody uh, on this, um, uh, in, in this, uh, in the audience, uh, is 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 sort of on the you know, on the same page. I know many of you are are uh, experts and know uh, as much, uh, far more than I I do on this. But nevertheless, I think it's worthwhile to to uh, kind of go through a very very brief intro on that. And then, as it says here in the overview, we'll talk a little bit about the threats to Waits Glacier. That's a huge topic, far outside the scope of what I know and what I'm going to talk about. So that will be very short indeed. And then I'll go into the main part of this, which are the vulnerabilities uh, and uh, of Waits Glacier and its impacts on sea level and then the outlooks are. Uh, what you're seeing on the right side there is a photograph I took uh, from an airplane looking out over the Amundsen Sea. You can see patches of ice and the ice cliff of the uh, uh, Thwaites Glacier ice shelf in the, in the background. It's uh, nearly impossible to estimate uh, uh, s sizes from an airplane, as you all well know. When you're sitting in the back, you don't know how far off the deck you are or how big things are, but uh, that's probably tens of meters, a few tens of meters. So uh, that's what, that's what um, uh, Thwaites Glacier looks like, or at least that piece of it. Uh, this is my uh, single gratuitous penguin uh, picture. You can't give a talk about Antarctica uh, without showing that. There will be no more penguins uh, after this, but nevertheless, there's the one penguin. Rita, uh, so we have a problem. Your slides are not advancing on the screen. Um, you, am, am I still on the overview slide? Uh, you're still on the title slide at the moment on the... Uh, Oh, well, I'm on slide number three here. Let me stop the share and bring it up again. Are you seeing the overview slide now? seeing the title slide again. Okay. Sharing is paused. Bring your shared window to the front. Now what are you saying? Glaciers and sea level. Title okay. slide. How about now? Overview. Okay. But in your, I think if I go to play back. this. Bring your shared window to the front. Okay, we're gonna have to do this the old fashioned way, um, which is to, uh, if you're seeing this, then um, uh, hopefully y'all can can see that. I'll, I'll make this as big as I can uh, and, and just continue. So uh, as I said, this is the overview uh, uh, and I'll go through the intro uh, and, and then talk about, uh, let me try one last thing if you'll bear with me. How's that look? It's the last slide and it has a statement on it because annotation is disabled. Your participants need to upgrade to the latest version of Zoom to share their screen. Okay. I'm not seeing any of that. Okay. That was on my screen actually. 
Apologies. <laughs> what are you seeing now? Just my, hopefully my screen. Everyone says they think it was working just then. So. Okay. All right. All right. We're going to, uh, uh, hopefully you're seeing something here that is, that is useful. Uh, and, uh, uh, I think I went through this, uh, this slide already. Uh, so, uh, again, just to, uh, sort of my very, very brief intro, uh, to, to glaciology, uh, just so everybody's sort of on the same page, uh, glaciers and sea level are, uh, uh, sort of a, in a, in a dance together. Uh, you get evaporation from the oceans that falls on, on as snow on the ice sheets. And then those ice sheets then return that ice back to the oceans either as melt or as in the case of Thwaites Glacier, for the most part, iceberg, icebergs breaking off of the front. If you can see my mouse, well, I, I can't see my mouse, so I, uh, you can see it either. Uh, it, it will uh, return that ice to the ocean uh, in the form of icebergs, uh, which are on the, uh, on the left side of this cartoon that you're looking at, hopefully. Uh, and it is that uh, uh, dance between uh, the ice sheets and the ocean that controls the size of the ice sheets and it controls sea level. Uh, if uh, more snow falls on the ice sheets than is removed from the ocean, then the ice sheets grow. Um, the sort of the, some of the terms that I'll be using here are the ice sheet for the main part of Antarctica or Greenland. And then a glacier is a piece of that ice sheet that has organized itself into uh, somewhat faster flow and is making its way out to the ocean. Uh, and I'll be talking in particular about Thwaites Glacier. Uh, it, many of these glaciers uh, that ring Antarctica, when they get to the ocean, uh, they don't simply stop or fall apart right there. Uh, they continue to trundle out into the ocean in the form of an ice shelf which is just a floating piece of, uh, of that glacier. And, and the transition from the glacier to the ice shelf is called the, the grounding line. Eventually, the ice shelf gets so thin and weak that it breaks apart into, into big icebergs. Those icebergs float off into the ocean and melt, and the cycle begins anew. All right, so that's my very, very brief introduction to glaciology. Uh, and those of you who are not glaciologists, uh, if you have further questions on this, I can take them at the end. Um, the ice sheet size, again, for, as an introduction, uh, is really a balance between what I call income and expenditures. Uh, uh, you get snowfall in the ice sheet, and you get melting and iceberg calving on the right hand, uh, uh, and, and the ice sheet size is sort of controlled by that. If there's no change in snowfall on the ice sheet, but there is an increase in melting, an increase in iceberg calving, uh, things like that. If your expenditures go up, then the ice sheet shrinks. And uh, because of this dance between ice sheets and, and sea level, sea level rises. Very, very straightforward. All right. Uh, the threats to Thwaites Glacier. As I said, this is going to be very, very short. Uh, and this is it. Uh, the singular threat to Thwaites Glacier uh, and really to all glaciers around the planet is our rising global temperatures. Uh, this is, uh, these are data through uh, the end of 2018, uh, but the trend has continued unabated into 2019 and now in, into uh, 2020. Uh, and temperatures have risen uh, about uh, a little more than a degree uh, compared to the early part of the last century. And uh, that temperature rise in the atmospheres is reflected in temperature rise in the oceans. It's reflected in changing circulation uh, of, of, ocean, uh, of winds and, and ocean waters around Antarctica. All these things are threats to Thwaites glaciers. And when I say threats, they, uh, what I mean is that they uh, 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 alter that balance, that dance between uh, ice sheets and sea level. Uh, to the detriment of the glacier and to the uh, and 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 uh, in the direction of raising sea level. All right, so that's my my one plot about the threats. Um, those of you who don't know uh, uh, where or what Antarctica is, uh, it is obviously uh, in the southern hemisphere at the 
uh, it surrounds the South Pole, um, it is uh, big. Uh, I've overlaid it on North America. Uh, I'll be happy to, uh, uh, those of you who are interested, I can send you a link to a wonderful uh, website where you uh, can uh, overlay any two parts of the planet. Uh, uh, you, you can uh, rotate each of the globes on the left-hand side uh, in real time, and, and you can compare the relative sizes of any two pieces of the world. And it's quite surprising uh, and, and instructive to see what the different uh, sizes of the planet are when you see them uh, properly projected. Uh, and you can see that Antarctica is enormous. It stretches all across North America. Uh, for scale on the right side, I have um, uh, a, a, a plot showing the, um, uh, a figure showing the size relative to the state of Pennsylvania, which is where I live. It's one of the 50 US states. It's one of the larger ones. Uh, and, uh, uh, I'm comparing Thwaites Glacier, sorry, not all of Antarctica. Thwaites Glacier is a small piece of, of Antarctica. Uh, it it, it uh, is uh, as large as the island of uh, the main part of Britain, uh, uh, Scotland, Wales, and, and England together. It's, a, it's as big as Florida. Uh, it's a, a, a good chunk of, uh, of the size of India uh, um, uh, between a uh, sixth and a fifth of, of the size of India. This, so Thwaites Glacier, that one glacier alone, uh, is, is an enormous place. And so, and, and as a glacier, it contains ice. And again, back to that balance between uh, the size of the glacier and, <clears throat> and sea level, if Thwaites Glacier starts to shrink and lose mass, all of that goes somewhere, and that somewhere is the ocean. And when that mass, that water goes into the ocean, then sea level rises. All right, uh, so uh, if all of Thwaites Glacier's ice were to go into the ocean, uh, sea level will rise uh, by some good chunk of a meter, so about 60 to 70 centimeters. Um, and uh, if all of West Antarctica, and I, I didn't tell you what West Antarctica is, but West Antarctica is a a piece of Antarctica. It's the part that is uh, uh, sort of between the Antarctic Peninsula and the Transantarctic Mountains. And again, if people have questions about that, I can I can go back and show some of the maps at the end. Uh, if if uh, all, all of uh, West Antarctica were or, or a big chunk of West Antarctica were to melt, then sea level would rise by something closer to three meters. So this one single glacier uh, is. Uh, uh, you know, a, a, a little bit less than a third of the entire uh, West Antarctic ice sheet. Its contribution to sea level it would be enormous uh, in the event that, that, that it were to melt completely. Uh, it, the reason it is particularly vulnerable to melt is that it's a, well, it's a marine glacier. Uh, it ends in the ocean, in the Amundsen Sea. The Amundsen Sea is a piece of the, of the, the sort of southernmost part of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and its bed is deep below sea level. And I'll show a, a, a little cartoon here in a second illustrating that. Uh, and as I said, it's a key part of the Western Arctic Ice Sheet. And so uh, 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 how goes Thwaites Glacier goes uh, uh, West Antarctica. And so it's worth uh, keeping an eye on it, and because it is the most vulnerable piece of West Antarctica, West Antarctica is the most vulnerable part of the Antarctic, and the Antarctic is uh, uh, the, uh, the largest potential contributor of water. It's the only other place on the planet that, that a big chunk of water lives other than the ocean. Uh, uh, now I keep saying, uh, focusing on Thwaites Glacier, but there have been some recent um, uh, studies showing that there's some uh, other glaciers in East Antarctica that are as large uh, and share some of these characteristics. So what we learn from Thwaites Glacier um, in the project that, that I'll talk about a little bit at the end, uh, the International Thwaites Glacier Collaboration, what we learn from there will really uh, inform some of these other studies from some of these other glaciers in East Antarctica and perhaps lead us to a, a better and fuller understanding of this uh, potential for sea level rise over the next 
decades to centuries. Um, current state of Thwaites, uh, it's, a, as I say up there, a litany of superlatives. It is a vast glacier. I've already talked about how big it is in comparison to some of the places that y'all might be familiar with. Well, if, uh, if uh, Thwaites Glacier were to stand shoulder to shoulder with all the other glaciers of the world, uh, it would not uh, have to uh, shrink and shame at, at any aspect of its uh, different features. It is the widest glacier in the world, a couple hundred kilometers wide. Uh, it's enormous, it's deep, it's fast. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, negative superlative. It is, uh, uh, according to many models, uh, susceptible losing mass the quickest. Uh, so there are many glaciers around the world in Greenland and in Antarctica and obviously in the mountains uh, around the world in the Himalayas and the Alps and, and in the U.S. Uh, in Canada. But uh, uh, the Thwaites Glacier, according to models, is the one that could lose its mass the most uh, uh, rapidly. Uh, I mentioned the grounding line before. The grounding line, and that's the photograph on the right-hand side, I'm standing on the Thwaites Glacier ice shelf and I'm looking inland towards Thwaites Glacier and you can see a break about a third of the way up the photograph and then the slightly darker ice and the top third of the photograph is just uh, uh, the blue sky. Uh, 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 but that rise in the, in, in the middle ground is uh, where the glacier is it's coming towards me, towards the photographer and it has to go over this grounding line, and then when it gets out into the ocean, it goes, um, it goes afloat and gets flatter. Uh, and the grounding line uh, could retreat. In other words, uh, that location where you see that rise could move farther and farther back into uh, uh, what is now grounded ice of, um, of Thwaites Glacier. And, and so all of that ice, which is currently sitting on rock, uh, would come afloat, and uh, as soon as it does that, then it starts to contribute uh, to sea level rise. Uh, as, as many of you will know, the ice that I'm standing on over there, the ice shelf, uh, has already done its job, done its uh, duty of raising sea level, as it were, uh, and, and so it will, melting the chunk of ice that I'm standing on, the ice shelf won't make any difference to, uh, to sea level, but it's, the worry is about the ice that is still uh, uh, inland of that grounding line. If that were to, 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 uh, to go afloat, then, then we'd have to worry about it. How rapidly could that happen? That's the big question. Uh, if it takes <clears throat> uh, 500 to 1,000 years, uh, then perhaps uh, societies around the world uh, could adapt to that and, uh, and, and uh, deal with that uh, it, it would be expensive, it would be painful, but, but perhaps they could uh, uh, organize themselves to handle that rise in sea level. Uh, the reason that Thwaites Glacier is particularly susceptible to this, uh, to this loss of ice is something called the marine ice sheet instability. Uh, marine, as I said, is, uh, uh, an, a, is a, a, marine, a marine glacier is one uh, that uh, has its nose sticking into the into the ocean, but it also has a bed that's below sea level. So on the top left uh, of this uh, uh, cartoon here is a cross section through Thwaites Glacier. On the left is the ocean, open ocean, on the right is the main part of the glacier, and that line uh, separating the green and the white is uh, sea level. Uh, on the very, very left, that bit with the arrow is, uh, is, is an ice shelf that's already afloat. The dotted red line is the grounding line, and uh, everything to the right of that grounding line is grounded ice. It's sitting on rock. Uh, it, it isn't contributing to sea level. It isn't doing, uh, uh, it's, it's flowing from right to left, and it's doing its, its job of moving ice from the interior out to the ocean. Uh, but it's uh, uh, not contributing extra to sea level. Uh, the problem comes in if that grounding line uh, uh, in, the, in the second graph over there, uh, the, the second cartoon on the left, if that grounding line moves uh, to the right, moves inland, moves 
away from the ocean and towards the towards the glacier, all of that ice that was be that's between those two red dotted lines has now been uh, 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 added to uh, to uh, to the ocean. Uh, now, if, as you can pro as you might be able to see by looking at that at those two cartoons, uh, the red dotted line in the upper uh, plot is relatively uh, short, and the red dotted line in the second plot is much longer. So as the grounding line shifts back, the ice thickness at the grounding line gets thicker and thicker. And this is the key part of the uh, uh, um, uh, ice sheet instability that was recognized um, uh, decades ago by Wertman and many, many others. Uh, and, and many of you will be familiar with it in the audience, but I, I, I think it's worth emphasizing uh, uh, that this is the, 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 the unique aspect, not entirely unique, but one important aspect of Thwaites Glacier that sets it apart is that, that when the grounding line retreats into the interior, the thickness of the ice at the grounding line gets thicker, uh, which leads to an increase in flux across that grounding line, which leads to, far, to, which leads to further retreat, which leads to a further thickening of the grounding line, which leads to further increase in flux, and on and on and on. And that's the second word uh, in this uh, phrase, instability. A small retreat leads to a greater retreat, which leads to a greater retreat, and that instability could uh, 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 remove a large part of Thwaites Glacier uh, very rapidly. Again, how rapidly? That's the big question. Uh, the two plots on the right-hand side, uh, the, those uh, lovely uh, 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 reds and yellows, uh, that piece in the black box is West Antarctica. The piece on the right is uh, East Antarctica. Uh, all the colored places, are places that are below sea level and are potentially susceptible to this grounding line retreat ice, uh, marine ice sheet instability scenario. Now, if you look at that, at that graph uh, or look at that map, one of the things that uh, sort of stands out is uh, that uh, the, uh, the piece if you, if you see the triangle in the bottom part called uh, labeled Ross Ice Shelf, uh, there's a big chunk of ice right behind it, that, that big chunk of red there, the, the so-called cyclocoast ice streams. Uh, those ice streams are protected by the Ross Ice Shelf, at least for now. Similarly, in the upper part of that plot, you have uh, where you, if you can see the, the uh, uh, label uh, Waddell Sea, uh, that's the Filcher Ronnie ice shelf, and the ice that flo that it, that sits behind it, uh, the reds and, and yellows behind it, are protected by the Filcher Ronnie ice shelf. However, Thwaites Glacier, if you look on the left-hand side where the label says Amundsen Sea, uh, Thwaites Glacier flows right into the Amundsen Sea, and it doesn't have one of these uh, uh, vast uh, ice shelves protecting it from the open ocean. Uh, the lower, the lower uh, graph uh, on the right-hand side uh, shows the, uh, a zoom-in on that area, and you can see the extent of, of Thwaites Glacier, and it's sticking its nose directly into the Amundsen Sea with a very small ice shelf uh, uh, that's uh, keeping, it, uh, keeping it from, uh, uh, from the full wrath of the ocean, as it were. Uh, whereas things like Rutford Ice Stream and Ice Stream B and, and C that Tavia referred to before, those are protected at, at some level by um, uh, 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 the ice shelves in front of them. Uh, so I've been talking to myself for the last 25 minutes. Is everybody okay? Can I get at least one thumbs up there that, uh, that okay, good. I see a couple there. All right. Uh, so Thwaites Glacier uh, is uh, heading from the uh, from the interior out to the ocean. Uh, it's susceptible because of all of these, uh, or vulnerable because of all of these various uh, characteristics that I, I that I just identified. Uh, but the rate at which that grounding line could retreat uh, 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 appears 
uh, to be controlled by uh, the properties of the bed that the glacier is sliding over. Thwaites Glacier moves by sliding over its bed. Not all glaciers do, uh, but once a glacier starts to move fast enough, uh, it, can't, uh, it can't manage to move by uh, deforming uh, the ice itself. So the ice just moves as a chunk sliding over the bed. It's as if you're moving a box across the, across the, the floor in your, uh, in your house. Uh, and you, as you push that box along uh, uh, across the floor, if your floor is smooth and 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 uh, uh, and waxed and 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 uh, uh, you've you've got all of the everything set up to move your box smoothly, then the box will move easily. But if you're trying to move that box across uh, gravel or or a rough surface or corrugated surface, it's going to be much harder. Uh, that analogy actually holds reasonably well for for glaciers as well. Um, what is the bed like? That's the big question that relates to the first question. How fast? How rapidly will the grounding line retreat? Uh, how rapidly the grounding line retreat really comes down to what is its bed like? And some important uh, things that we need to know about that bed are its shape, its topography, where are there bumps, where are there highs, where are there lows. So just getting its shape is, is important. Uh, as uh, most of you are glaciologists on, on this on, on this um, uh, uh, presentation, you'll know that uh, ice thickness is the is the most important parameter that you can have about a glacier. If you if you know ice thickness and you know its surface slope, uh, you know ninety percent of what you need need to know about a, about a glacier. And so that's a very important parameter that we need about about uh, Thwaites Glacier is its topography. What is the thickness at all the different spots within its catchment? Uh, another thing that we need to know is the strength of the bed. Uh, is it a soft bed? Is it a hard bed? Is it smooth? Is it wet? All those things. And then speaking of wetness, where is the water? Uh, water is the, uh, the, the softest thing out there uh, in nature, or at least under glaciers, uh, um, and, and, and water can uh, lubricate that, that interface very effectively, so we need to know the distribution of water. Uh, here's a photograph again of uh, uh, ice in the Amundsen Sea. Some icebergs there uh, frozen into the sea ice. Uh, and this happens to be a photograph of Pine Island Glacier, but, uh, but, but uh, it also uh, shares many of the characteristics of Thwaites Glacier. And if we take a look at a, 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 a cross section, looking up the glacier from, from the ocean up to the interior, uh, this is a model done by my colleague, Byron Karazek, uh, and he asked that question. Uh, let's say we know something about the bed. We know whether it's hard or whether it's soft. We know whether it's steep or bumpy, uh, uh, steep and bumpy or smooth and flat. We know whether it's wet or dry. And, and we can put that into our uh, model and, and run that simulation forward. Uh, and, uh, um, Surprisingly, he could get almost any answer that he wanted. He could have Thwaites Glacier, so the two graphs on the left-hand side uh, show in the green line uh, uh, the starting configuration for Thwaites Glacier. The top surface is shown with the green line and comes down and goes into the ocean. Uh, and then he ran that simulation forward with different uh, types of beds uh, uh, in this case, he chose to do a hard bed, slippery bed, uh, and he could get two different answers. He could get either the red line in the upper graph, which is uh, that the ice surface has, uh, has dropped by over a kilometer in, in 300 years, or in the lower case, for a different set of conditions for the bed, uh, the upper surface has hardly changed at all in 300 years. And so, uh, depending on those properties of the bed, that big question of how rapidly the grounding line could move away from its current uh, position and that ice can be contributed to sea level, uh, uh, change, the answer changes uh, enormously depending on what the properties of the bed are. Uh, so, uh, as, I, as I said, some of the uh, key unknowns or, or somewhat knowns are Topography, 
Uh, this is a plot, uh, uh, a, a, a figure from my colleague uh, Nick Holshu and um, uh, Knut Christensen and others at the University of Washington. Uh, Thwaites Glacier map is on the lower left, uh, and you don't need to worry about the colors on there. It's really just a, 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 a location map showing you where uh, these two boxes on the right-hand side are drawn from the two small black boxes on the left-hand side. Uh, and you can see the topography is very variable. The horizontal scale there is something like 40 kilometers uh, uh, from uh, uh, north to south on, the, on each of those boxes and about 20 kilometers east and west on each of those boxes. Uh, and uh, the topography varies by hundreds of meters uh, from the uh, sort of greens and browns, uh, uh, um, which are the high, high places where the ice is relatively thin, uh, to the blues and whites where the ice is smooth and flat. And you can see the character changes enormously as well. There are places where uh, the bed is streamlined in the direction of flow. Flow is from uh, the right to the left in this, in both cases. Uh, you can see where the ice, uh, the bed is uh, streamlined in some places and it is modeled and, 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 uh, and bumpy in other places. There's deep canyons that run through it across the, across the fabric of the, of the flow. Uh, so there's lots and lots of interesting detail there. And sadly, uh, much of this detail is not captured in, in many uh, models, uh, simply because uh, if you can see in the two uh, black boxes on the left-hand side, uh, the, those two black boxes encompass, uh, as, uh, uh, as somebody once twigged me in, in, in a meeting, a postage stamp. Uh, this was a, a, a marine geophysicist who simply has to sit on a ship and get uh, vast amounts of information about the ocean, uh, but for us to get even a small amount of information in these postage stamps uh, takes a lot of effort. And I'll talk about that effort in a little bit here. Uh, but we have, a, we have some information about these two black boxes on Thwaites Glacier. We see there's enormous variability uh, in, in just those areas. Uh, what else is there in the rest of Thwaites Glacier that we don't know about yet, that we ought to know about, the modelers ought to know about, so that that big question can be answered. Um, this is my colleague, Kaya Riverman from uh, uh, University of Oregon. Uh, and she's uh, conducting a seismic reflection survey uh, following on on work that was uh, really done uh, 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 so remarkably well uh, back in the uh, 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 1980s and 90s uh, by uh, Don Blankenship, Sean Rooney, Charlie Bentley, Andy Smith, many others uh, that showed that the properties of the bed uh, were important. Uh, people always knew that, but uh, it was uh, it was really with this work on Ice Stream B and other places uh, that, that, that the vast range of possible bed properties uh, uh, that the glacial geologists had been identifying for a long time, but had not been really brought into the uh, dynamic glaciology world, this really was, uh, was done. And now it's being, this work is being carried forward by people like Kaya and Lizzie Klein and Atsumuto, some of the people that I work with um, uh, here in our group. So how do you estimate these critical parameters? Uh, there's a number of ways. You can use uh, radar methods. That uh, uh, plot that I showed you earlier of those two block boxes and the topography over the boxes, that's a remarkable result uh, from uh, Nick and Knut and others uh, where they could use the radar data to form this, uh, this sort of 3D image of the bed uh, uh, so there's just just incredible uh, leaps and bounds in, in information that are that's coming. Uh, radar can also give internal layer internal layer geometries, which gives you insights into the flow history. Uh, and then obviously uh, those of you who are satellite remote sensors or anybody who uh, uh, likes to poke around on Google Earth or any of those other uh, wonderful apps that you can find now you know that you can get surface elevation and surface topography, morphology, all sorts of inf interesting information about the surface uh, just from uh, the uh, remarkable array of satellite, uh, uh, what is it that the 
military called assets uh, that are that are up there. And then, as I mentioned just briefly in the in the previous slide about Kaya and Lizzie and Don Blankenship and others, uh, seismic reflections can really tell you something about the properties of the bed. Uh, here's a, uh, 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 an image from, uh, I don't know why it got all messed up like this. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, th this is, uh, uh, there we go. Uh, I don't know if I can get rid of the, yes, I, yes, I can. I don't know why that is. So this is a cross section through a piece of Thwaites Glacier. And you don't really need to worry about uh, any of the details at any great level. That, that's, uh, this is a cross section with uh, 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 depth to the, to the bottom of the ice in the vertical axis and, and distance of about 40 kilometers across. And that black line that runs through the middle of, the, of that upper plot is the bottom of the glacier. And uh, the middle, the middle uh, graph, uh, which I've labeled hard and soft, uh, is showing you that there is a variability in the properties of the bed with those dots uh, that are lower down indicating softer bed and those dots that are higher up indicating harder bed. Uh, and so there, are, there is uh, considerable variability just within this 40 kilometer range. And in fact, there's variability in here at the sort of few kilometer ranges where you go from soft to hard uh, in very, very short order, in very short distance. Uh, and there is a relationship to uh, what's going on uh, with the topography. So there's a, the, we need to know the topography, and then you need to drill down one level deeper and know what the properties of the bed within that topography, topography is. And uh, those bumps in the bed uh, are critically important to the flow of the glacier. Uh, they may be small. The ice is uh, two kilometers thick, and these bumps are only uh, tens of meters or, or maybe a hundred meters high, uh, uh, but even they are, uh, are, are seen by the glacier, if you will. The glaciers have to flow around and over those bumps. They move sediments and water depending on those bumps, and the models need to uh, include the effect. The photographs on the right-hand side are from Greenland and Iceland uh, on showing you the sort of the, the, the uphill or uh, stoss side of one of these bumps, and you can see how uh, nearly vertical uh, that, that one is, smooth, smoothed off, and, and it looks very different on the lee side. Uh, and, and, and our seismic reflection work that Atsu and Lizzie and others and Kaya have done have showed that there is a relationship in those bumps with the properties on the, on, on the up glacier side and the down glacier side. And, and so now we have to understand the bed at the scale of tens of meters vertically and, and a few kilometers horizontally, uh, which is again, an enormous challenge, but like the princess and the pea, if those of you who know that fable, uh, the princess was sleeping on her bed and, some, and there were some peas stuck underneath the mattress and, 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 and uh, spoiled royal that she was, she, she complained.
Hi everyone. It looks like we have uh, lost Shreda. Um, I'm going to try and see if I can get him back. Um, but if his internet is down, it's a little bit hard to know how we're going to contact him. Um, if anyone has any bright ideas, feel free to uh, tell me. Richard, do you have um, Sridhar's mobile number? Um, Don Void has tried to call him and um, Kai Riverman got a text from Sridhar that says, I'm trying to reconnect. So uh, okay. Don is on at the moment. Sounds like we should just uh, wait and be patient then. Yeah, Thank sit you. tight for a moment. Uh, if we don't get him back, you've got several of the people who did the work, including Kaya and a few others on here, um, who did the work with him. So um, if need be, we can chat. Ah, Sridhar says he's back but muted. Let me find him and unmute him. All yours, Sridhar. Oh, no, no. There we go. All yours, Sridhar. Okay. All right. I hope I'm back. Uh, you are back. And I hope I don't disconnect again. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, those of you uh, who've been to State College know that I live in a somewhat rural area and I uh, don't have the best internet. Uh, it was working fine today, which is why I decided to risk doing it from home. That was a mistake. All right, let me uh, finish up here. I still have a, uh, let me share my screen. Host to disabled attendee screen sharing. Tavi, can you re-enable me? You should be able to do it now, uh, Sridhar, um, your co-host again. All right. Okay, uh, so uh, finally, uh, uh, can you all hear me? We're good? All right, so Thwaites Glacier ends in the ocean and it could form faces that break. Uh, and as the grounding line retreats, uh, that face gets higher and higher and the breakage goes faster. So this is yet another instability. Uh, and in that word instability, again, is one where uh, things, uh, as they start to go, go faster. Uh, the outlook. Uh, we need people. We need people to study, model, and uh, uh, project what Thwaites and other glaciers may do in the future. Uh, we need data from Thwaites on what the oceans, the cliff, the bed, everything looks like in detail. And then, of course, as all of you well know, uh, uh, that uh, threat is one that uh, uh, is a global problem and needs a global solution. Uh, the ITGC, there's a website here, thwaitesglacier.org. Uh, I'm happy to share this presentation for anybody that would like it, so, so uh, you can look at that. It's a joint project with partnerships from around the world, and really the focus is on uh, coordinated fieldwork and modeling efforts to look at Thwaites in, in the past, in the present, and then into the near future to try and understand what its contributions to sea level might be. Uh, GHOST is the, one of the projects that I'm a part of. It's a joint project between uh, myself and 
folks at the British Antarctic Survey and the Alfred Wegener Institute in Germany. Uh, and the goal is to map the bed of Thwaites uh, um, as thoroughly as possible. It has a, a lot of partners, and I don't apologize for showing this list of names because I think, as I said before, it's people that matters. It's people that are going to make uh, allow us to solve this problem. And uh, so finally, I'd like to thank NSF and NERC, uh, my students, colleagues, my university, and then obviously IGS for, for hosting this uh, series. Uh, and I think I will uh, take questions now. Um, I still have a few minutes of my time left. I apologize for the technical glitches. Tavi, how do you want to do this? I suggest that if people have questions, they type something like yes into the uh, chat box and then I will unmute uh, people one at a time rather than unmuting absolutely everyone while we've got 200 people on. I think that might get a bit cacoph cacophonous. So um, are there any questions from anybody? If you type into the chat box. Um, okay, one second Dennis. Um, You are unmuted, Dennis. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sridhar, for the talk. Um, Sridhar, just this is maybe kind of um, uh, an out there question, but looking ahead in the future, do you think we'll ever know the bed topography and um, friction or things that control friction well enough? to like to what level will we be able to model if you know looking i don't know 10 20 50 years from now what we'll know of the bed then yeah so the uh, good question uh um so i think we have a hope of having the topography in in marvelous detail um in within the next decade or more. Of course, it depends on the resources that are thrown at it. Thwaites Glacier is far away from everything. You, you, you just about can't get further away from, from a lot of the bases. So it's a difficult place to access. But the technology is continually improving. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I think getting bed topography is, um, is, is, is within the scope of, of, of where we could be. Uh, bed properties is a is a much tougher one because uh, to the, the the tool that we use most is uh, seismic reflection work, which means you have to have uh, you have to be scanning on the glacier to get that seismic energy in and out. The project that I'm a part of with uh, my colleague Andy Smith at the British Antarctic Survey is to do that in as much detail as we can to as much of Thwaites as we can over the next two to three years. Uh, but it won't be nearly enough uh, uh, it, uh, to, to sort of answer this. And, and perhaps the modelers can use that and extrapolate from it. But that's one of the critical issues. So we have a quest couple of questions on the chat, uh, Shreda. Um, yeah, I, I can see that. So one of the questions is uh, from Ernest Schrama, how well can you predict the fate of Thwaites Glacier. Uh, and that is really the goal of this ITGC project, is to try and make, uh, so, so we can easily predict the fate of Thwaites Glacier, uh, but uh, how well do we believe that prediction? What are the uncertainties in that prediction? Uh, the goal of, the, uh, of this sort of integrated project is to reduce those uncertainties uh, so that uh, folks can can take away from it a more uh, reliable and believable estimate. So I, I can't answer that question, um, what the fate of Thwaites Glacier would be in 100 years time. Uh, we hope we will get there. Uh, another question from Bryony Freer, how does the stability and future outlook of Thwaites compare to that of Pine Island? That's a good question. Pine Island Glacier, for those of you who might not know, uh, is, uh, a neighboring glacier. It's, uh, 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 it also flows into the Amundsen Sea. It's also a marine terminating uh, uh, glacier. So in theory, it ought to be susceptible to many of the same 
uh, forces that, that I'm worried about for Thwaites, it's a much smaller glacier. It's narrower. It's about 50 or 60 kilometers wide. There's high mountains on either side. And so the, it isn't as uh, unbounded uh, and, it, and the bed alone doesn't control it. So uh, um, Ted Scambos uh, just said there's a nice paper on pile instability uh, uh, that uh, perhaps has an answer to that question. But it, I, I believe that the current consensus is that Thwaites Glacier is more susceptible to, to instabilities. Uh, should we looking at glaciers like Denman Glacier, Totten Glacier, this is from Simon Carr. Uh, absolutely. So uh, there are uh, many places in East Antarctica that uh, share these same characteristics that the Thwaites Glacier does. They uh, have their nose stuck into the ocean. They have relatively small ice shelves in front of them. They have deep basins behind them. Uh, and so I think there is cause to worry for many, many places uh, there. Uh, the only place in Greenland, if I could uh, editorialize for a second, uh, that is, uh, oh, I didn't even, even have to editorialize. There's a question from Michelle Guitard. Uh, are there northern glaciers in Greenland uh, uh, that are comparable to Thwaites? So I was going to say that um, there's a, the, the glacier that is uh, uh, in uh, northeast Greenland, the northeast Greenland ice stream, uh, is the only one that has a relatively deep bed and is relatively broad. Greenland is uh, a fairly uh, 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 elevated island. The, the rock underneath Greenland is quite high, and so the glaciers struggle to get to the ocean. Uh, and when they do, they come out in these narrow uh, fjords like Jakobshaven and Helheim and so on. Uh, and so the only analogy to Thwaites is, uh, uh, is in uh, Northeast Greenland ice stream, which goes off to the Northeast of Greenland. Uh, I will say, however, that the processes that ice is undergoing in Greenland are the same for all ice. The way ice fractures and breaks is this, uh, and the way glaciers uh, uh, and, and ice shelves and, and cliffs fail in Greenland is similar to how cliffs will fail in Antarctica. So there's much to be learned uh, from, from there. And mountain glaciers, uh, water flow beneath mountain glaciers is something that, that we can study in enormous detail and, 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 and wonderful glaciologists around the world have been doing that. And that informs our knowledge of what water flow beneath these larger glaciers would look like. Glacial geologists go out and look at the remains of, of what glaciers have done and that also informs us. So I think we have to sort of bring a lot of these pieces together. Uh, is there anything else, Tavy? Or did, uh, let me see. I had a question oh, pushed at me uh, for you, which is uh, a question about uh, whether there are opportunities for early career researchers uh, in this kind of project. Um, I don't know whether you've got any, anything in particular about how early career researchers are included, uh, mentored, or whatever within the Thwaites Glacier project. Oh yeah, so so I think that's an excellent question, and uh, as I think I tried to emphasize uh, a couple of times in the talk, uh, uh, the answers to to this and many other issues in glaciology are going to come from uh, early career folks. Uh, many of the collaborators in uh, in this project are early career folks, uh, um, uh, but really the 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 leadership has to has to uh, has to come from the early career folks. There are uh, funds within ITGC for uh, uh, postdocs and graduate student uh, support uh, in many institutions. Uh, I encourage you to go to the Thwaites Glacier website and see what uh, projects uh, uh, sort of pique your interest and uh, and see if those will. Uh, uh, have, have places for you. I know that we at Penn State are always looking uh, for uh, uh, excellent students to come and join us and we always have room for more. Ted's also added. And Ted, uh, oh, well you can see Ted's comment, <laughs> uh, special early career meetings for Thwaites early career people. Uh, from Tom James, uh, is progress being made on synthesizing these subgrid bed structures 
and processes into generalized uh, relationships. Uh, so uh, I'm not the best one to answer that. I think people are trying to, to, to do that. Um, but the, the, the sort of fine scale gridding, the fine scale modeling uh, is very much in its early days. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it, it is uh, uh, intractable for even for uh, some, uh, something as large as, something as small as Thwaites Glacier uh, to do at the, at, the, um, uh, at the grid scale that I showed you, for example, in that map of a few kilometers and a few meters vertically, uh, that, that's difficult to do. So there has to be some clever uh, 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 grid mixing that needs to go on, but uh, I don't know the answer to that, to be perfectly honest. Uh, Lori, is that Lori Padman? Are uh, uh, direct atmospheric impacts, surface meltwater likely to matter? So that's a, a question about possible uh, uh, um, changes in the changes in the glacier that come about from processes similar to what you see in Greenland, where you have these uh, vast surface lakes that drain through the ice and and lead to break up, or that we saw on the Antarctic Peninsula, where these lakes uh, form, or, or, or the water fills uh, crevasses, and, and you lead to break up. Uh, so a few year, a, a year ago, a couple of years ago, I'd said that we're, you know, a decade or two away, or three even, from seeing uh, uh, those kinds of processes, atmospheric processes, uh, surface meltwater processes, affect uh, 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 the surface of Thwaites Glacier. But the warming is so dramatic there and so rapid, and I don't know if that's simply a short-term uh, uh, feature or whether it's a trend, but it, it, there has been melt on the surface of Thwaites in the last uh, uh, two or three years, and so I, 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 all bets are off, and, and, and that would be an extremely worrisome one, and that is one that, that some, many of the modelers don't really encompass either. Uh, this question, Scott Braddock, this question relates to the slides. Talk a little more about the relationship between the ice that is two kilometers thick and bumps at the bed that are tens of meters in height. Okay, so um, uh, the, the question is uh, uh, the princess and the pea. You've got ice that is uh, two kilometers thick and this ice is flowing over its bed um, and why would it care about a small bump at its bed, uh, at, at its bottom, uh, that, is, that is only perhaps uh, 10 meters high and, and maybe a kilometer wide or something like that. Uh, and the, the ice is a relatively homogeneous material and most of the driving stress is, all the driving stress is concentrated at the bed. When this thing is sliding, uh, the driving stress is uh, on that uh, interface between the bed and, and the rock, in beneath, uh, rock beneath, and that's where it's concentrated. And so there, any small obstructions uh, are, uh, are magnified. In addition, um, as the ice is going around one of these bumps, there are small changes in pressure, higher pressure on the uphill side, slightly lower pressure on the downhill side. And because the bed is uh, uh, at the melting point, at the pressure melting point, there's water around. And water, as you well know, uh, is very, very good at exploiting small and reacting to small changes in pressure. And so the water then will flow around based on those bumps. So I think it really does need to be included in the model. Uh, what magnitude is the largest seismicity we've seen beneath the Thwaites Glacier? Uh, so there was a paper that uh, my colleague Paul Winberry uh, uh, published just uh, recently showing that the uh, ice shelf in front of Thwaites Glacier is a source of um, considerable seismicity. Uh, you have, uh, they're not the types of, uh, uh, of, of earthquakes perhaps that, uh, uh, that uh, Tian Jose is uh, most used to, sort of the tectonic earthquake or even the ones in the fern uh, that you talked about, but these are fracture and breakup and, and rotation of, uh, of the blocks. And uh, those, are, those are reasonably large. I, I don't know that we ever quoted a magnitude scale for them. 
but uh, they, they, they are visible hundreds of kilometers away. Uh, does this mean we can't fully trust the modelers as a lot has not been incorporated into their modeling sequences? Uh, there's a, a, a famous uh, uh, saying, uh, I'm sure all of you have heard it, uh, all models are wrong, uh, some models are useful. Uh, we, as modelers and as scientists, we all recognize that modelers contain, the results of models contain uh, the, uh, the, the, the parameters that went into them, the physics that went into them, and uh, we understand the uncertainties of the results that come from them. So uh, it's entirely uh, untrue to say we can't trust the modelers, we fully trust the modelers, uh, we just know that uh, some models with good physics and good parameters, for example, atmospheric models that tell me that the weather is going to be cooler tomorrow than it was today, uh, has good uh, physics and good data. We trust that well. Uh, uh, for the ice, we know that the, the, that the uncertainties are larger. Uh, Sophia Kufner, what are the most critical parameters on the bed modelers would love to get from people doing geophysics? How much detail complexity can really be included in the models? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, um, <laughs> I just saw the next uh, uh, comment, all models are wrong except for Anders. Uh, so the cr critical parameters on the bed, on, on, on the bed uh, as I said, topography, but I think that's something that, that, that we can all agree on. Uh, distribution of water, you know, the, 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 the hydrologic gradients and, the, and where the water is moving around on the bed. And then what's called the, the, the sliding law. So my colleague Luke Zut and Neil Iverson just published a paper uh, where they put forward a, a generalized sliding law uh, that uh, uh, uses the, that, 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 use, that, that could use the properties that we determined from the field and provide a sliding law that then the modelers could in incorporate in their models. Um, so it really comes down to the bed rheology, so the stress strain relationship uh, between driving stress and, and strain rate of the bed. Uh, that rheology is the one that the modelers really would like to have. Um, I, uh, while these questions are coming in, I'm just gonna throw up, I hope you all can see in the background uh, uh, if I'm still sharing my screen, uh, this is the talk that will be given next week, the downstream impacts of retreating glaciers on water, food, energy security from Carolyn Klass and at uh, Plymouth. Uh, are there more questions? I have a feeling we may have run out of questions. That was a... I enjoyed the talk. <laughs> Thank you all for uh, sticking with me through the technology uh, hiccups. I think we have to be incredibly impressed with the whole community. We had a, over 200 people, uh, 220 people at one point. So thank you very much indeed, Sridhar, and thank you to everyone for coming. See you next week. Cheers then. Bye all. Bye all. <laughs>